Welcome to the Intel Cordis Prime Software Design Series Timing Analyzer Online Training Part 1 Introduction to Timing Analysis. My name is Steve. This training is available for desktop viewing as well as in a format compatible with portable devices, both available from the same link included in your registration email. For either version, while watching the training, use the controls at the bottom and the side of the screen to navigate to any point. Feel free to pause the training at any time to experiment with the software. When you are done with the training, please use the link provided in the registration email you were sent to provide us feedback on the training and ways in which it could be improved. I'll remind you about that later. In this course, you will learn how to perform timing analysis in the Intel Cordis Prime software using Timing Analyzer. You will use Synopsys Design Constraints or .sdc files to constrain a design to meet timing requirements and to compare results. You will learn how to generate timing reports in Timing Analyzer and gaining familiarity with its graphical user interface. Here's the agenda for this training. First, we'll start with a look at basic timing analysis concepts and terminology used in Timing Analyzer. This will include a discussion of the terminology used to select nodes from the SDC netlist for targeting timing constraints. Subsequent parts of this training, available on the Intel training website and linked at the end of this training, will introduce you to the Timing Analyzer GUI and its use. You'll also learn how to incorporate Timing Analyzer into the Intel Cordis Prime design flow, take a closer look at Timing Analyzer's reporting features, and understand the SDC constraints required to fully constrain a design. Let's get started with the look at basic timing analysis concepts as well as the terminology used in the timing analyzer for constraining and validating timing requirements. So how does timing analyzer timing verification in the Intel Cordis Prime software work? As you'll see, the timing analyzer checks each and every path in the design with respect to the requirements specified by the designer. By looking at each and every path, we can catch problems faster and easier than with gate level simulation or with board testing. The caveat is that it is up to the designer to enter timing requirements and exceptions on all paths in the design. The software knows nothing about how the design is supposed to work with respect to timing, so timing constraints on all paths are required to guide the fitter. Once the fitter has placed and routed the design, the results can be compared to the original constraints to ensure that timing was met. Let's look at some basic timing analysis terminology that we'll use throughout this training as well as directly in the timing analyzer. All timing analysis is based on the schematic shown here. A source register drives a signal to a destination register. These registers may both be contained within an FPGA design or one of them may be part of some third-party device external to the FPGA on a board. Both the source and destination registers are clocked by some clock source, usually the same for both as shown here, but they could be clocked by two different sources. For a register-to-register -register path such as this, the launch edge is defined as the clock edge that activates the source register. The latch edge is the clock edge that activates the destination register. The relationship between these edges will be used to determine if register-to-register -register data transfers will occur properly. This relationship is derived from clock constraints that will be entered by you as the designer. Also note that the data valid window, the time during which the data signal is valid on the path between the two registers, opens some time after the launch edge and closes some time after the latch edge. Based on the launch edge, the data arrival time is defined as the time it takes for data launched from the source register by the launch edge of the clock to arrive at the de-input of the destination register. Looking at the data arrival path defined in the diagram, the data arrival time is calculated by adding the launch edge delay adjusted to some zero reference, the clock delay to the source register, referred to as T-clock1, the clock to timeout, or TCO, of the source register, and the data delay between the source and destination registers, which includes delays incurred by any combinational logic in the path. 
the data arrival time defines the start of the data valid window at the destination register and is calculated with this equation. The clock arrival time is the time it takes for the latch edge to arrive at the destination register's clock pin. It is equal to the latch edge adjusted to some zero reference plus the delay from the clock source to the clock input of the destination register. If the source and destination registers are in the same clock domain, the latch edge would be one clock period later with respect to the launch edge. If the clocks are coming from two different clock domains, then the actual difference in time between the launch and latch edges would be used. The data required time is the time that a signal sent by the source register must arrive at the D input of the destination register in order to be properly sampled. This calculation ensures that data does not arrive at the destination too late with respect to the time needed for a valid synchronous transfer. Based off the latch edge and the clock arrival time, the setup data required time depends on the setup time of the destination register, a direct function of the silicon. Data must be valid at the beginning of the setup time. The setup required time is equal to the clock arrival time minus TSU of the destination register minus an optional setup uncertainty. The setup uncertainty can be included in the calculation to help define a non-ideal clock allowing for clock jitter or a guard band. The data required time for hold calculation is the earliest time that a new signal value can arrive at the D input of the destination register and not interfere with the data that was sampled by the previous latch edge. This calculation ensures that new data doesn't arrive too soon with respect to the time needed for a valid synchronous data transfer. Like the setup time, the hold time is a function of the actual silicon. Again, based off the latch edge, the hold required time is equal to the clock arrival time plus the destination register's hold time requirement. The data must remain valid until this point, at which time new data can arrive at the destination. An optional hold uncertainty can be added in a similar fashion to the setup uncertainty. Our ultimate goal for timing on all paths in the design is to have positive slack. Slack is a measure of how well a design is meeting or missing its timing requirements. In order for a circuit to operate properly, the slack calculation must come out positive, meaning there is extra margin for meeting the setup or hold timing requirements. Thus, there are two calculations performed when determining the slack, one for setup and one for hold. By adding the clock arrival, data arrival, and data required paths to the diagram, we can see setup slack shown here. The setup slack is the difference between the data required time and the opening of the data valid window already defined as the data arrival time. Hold slack is defined in a similar fashion. It is based off the hold data required time and the fact that the latch edge of a data transaction is the launch edge of the next transaction. Filling in the data required path and the data arrival path for the next data transaction, we see that the hold slack is the difference between the data arrival time of the next transaction and the hold data required time. Having positive hold slack also prevents double clocking. Double clocking occurs when the data arrival time is so low when compared to the clock arrival time that the data is clocked through two subsequent register stages during a single clock cycle. Here is a summary of the two slack equations. Routing paths and components in the FPGA can have small ranges of delay. Timing Analyzer, by default, performs a pessimistic analysis, so the worst case values for both calculations are used. In both cases, if the calculated value is positive, time requirements have been met. If the value is negative, timing is failing on the data path. These equations will work whether we are talking about internal paths, I.O. paths, or asynchronous control signals. Now that we've defined basic timing terminology, let's take a look at the terminology used when creating SDC constraints. 
we will be creating an SDC netlist on which we can apply SDC constraints. An SDC netlist is a database of all the paths in the design and the known timing information about each of those paths. When you create constraints to try to meet the timing variables we've just defined, you have to apply or target the constraints to certain physical locations in the SDC netlist. This is done with the terminology listed here. To start, cells are the basic device building blocks. They can be anything, such as LUTs, registers, embedded multipliers, embedded memory, or I.O. elements. Typically, pins are thought of as device package pins. However, in an SDC netlist, pins are the inputs and outputs of cells. Ports are the top-level inputs and outputs of the design. In other words, they are the FPGA or CPLD device I.O. pins. Therefore, nets are the unit connects between pins and thus cells. So when referring to an SDC netlist, switch your standard thinking of what is a pin, what is a port to target your timing constraints to the correct location in the design. Finally, while registers are referred to as cells, they can also be referenced as simply registers. Here is a diagram of a design so we can see how to apply these SDC terms. This register, named in reg A, is considered a cell. This input I.O. element, named in A, is also considered a cell. The D input to the in reg A cell is a pin. The Q output from the cell is also a pin. This output from the device, named out, is a port. So in the netlist, device I.O. are considered both cells and ports. The connection between the out clock output pin of the clock control cell and the clock input pin of the outridge cell is a net. Listed near the bottom of the slide are the names of some of the pins and nets in the design. Notice that pin names are always associated with the name of a cell using the pipe character, and net names are associated with the driver cell and sometimes that cell's pin. Keep these physical locations in the design in mind since we'll be using them to create timing constraints. In SDC, each type of node or location defined on the previous slide belongs to one or more collections. Collections are used to search the node database to find items in the SDC netlist to which we can apply a constraint. To select a node in the netlist, a collection is called and then an item within the collection is specified. Some examples of collections are shown here. The collections that start with all refer to all of that particular item in the netlist. This is a quick way to target all of a particular type of item in the design. However, more often than not, constraints will target individual nodes or paths. To do this, the get collections are used. A path is defined by its endpoints, so using the get ports and get pins collections will be the easiest way to constrain a path or group of paths. Once we define clock constraints, the get clocks collection will be used to call out a particular clock for use in other constraints. There are a number of other types of collections you can use, but the ones listed here are the most common. If you want to create and use your own custom collections, you can do this through tickle scripting. The Add to Collection command lets you merge an existing collection with items from a second compatible collection, while Remove from Collection lets you selectively remove any item from an existing custom collection. For a more detailed discussion of the available collections and examples of their use, check out the Intel Cordis Prime Handbook chapter entitled Timing Analyzer, linked here. For information about creating and managing custom collections, see the Intel Cordis Prime built-in help. This concludes part one of the training. If you'd like to continue the training, you can register for parts two through four for free at the link shown here. To learn about additional resources available to help you with using the Timing Analyzer, continue to the next slide. For more information about timing analysis and the Timing Analyzer, be sure to read the Timing Analysis Overview and Timing Analyzer chapters in volume three of the Intel Cordis Prime Handbook, linked here. To learn techniques for closing timing in a design using SDC constraints and timing analyzer, see the timing closure and optimization chapter in volume 2. 
If you'd like hands-on experience with Timing Analyzer, or you want to learn advanced techniques for closing timing in a design, enroll in any of the Timing Analyzer related instructor-led courses listed here. There are many free online training courses just like this one that can help you learn more about timing analysis and timing closure. Use the links here to register for a course or to find more training at the Intel Training website. One last thing. When you registered for this training, a link was sent to you in your confirmation email that links to a short online survey. Please complete the survey to let us know what you think of this training and if you can think of ways it can be improved.